High Stakes, Episode 10. I'm your host, Neil Orfield, and I'm joined today by a guest who is pretty similar to myself in that he has been playing DFS for a number of years, or had been playing DFS for a number of years, uh, before he started seeing a ton of success after discovering the Osmo tools, just kind of came out of nowhere and started a win streak that uh, you don't see very often, just wins seemed like every day, or at least every week for a uh, month straight, and and you know over the course of a year, year and a half, was just crushing DFS uh, pretty regularly. It was really fun to see. He's a little bit different than me, though, in that he's also a lecturer at Stanford University, and this past fall taught a course called Probability and Gambling. Uh, Gene, I don't want to brag, but it is about 50 degrees here in Minnesota today, so that's pretty great. How's the weather uh, out in California? Um, it's in the 60s, I think, right now. The mid-60s, right. high 70s, it's, it's perfect weather. So not not too different, though. I mean, we're, we're about the same here. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, we're the same people. We live in the same weather-ish places. <laughs> That's right. I mean, you, you like to tell me how nice the weather is there sometimes. So I just, I thought I had to brag that it's, you know, it's sunny here. It's in the fifties or at least it's close to the fifties. So, uh, yeah, pr- we, can, we can talk tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, let's not. Uh, all right. So generally I start out these interviews by talking with people, uh, about their backgrounds with you. I want to take a little bit of a different route, uh, because I want to first touch on your present and your future in DFS. Uh, just looking through your recent results on Roto Grinders. I see that you have not been playing a ton of DFS recently. Uh, you haven't played anything other than PGA in about six weeks. And so far in April, it's now, it's the 21st of April. As far as I can tell, you've played only four entries, uh, in golf so far this month. I don't know if you played today. Um, but I'm just curious, are you are you taking a break right now? Are you heading toward retirement from DFS? Or are you uh, working in silence, just kind of honing in your, your DFS skills? Oh, um, so I, you know, really vamped up my DFS um, playing during the pandemic. So, you know, I, I started playing a lot in uh, like summer 2020 and really just vamped it up 2021, which is when like everything started hitting. And then, so we returned to in-person teaching. So, you know, instead of, instead of teaching on Zoom, I had to be on campus the whole day. So I had l- l- much less time to uh, focus on DFS. So that's why starting, I think around September, 2021, there's my, my entries have s- just dropped off. You just don't have the time anymore before slates here. You were kind of running into that issue, as I recall, even during the pandemic, just the timing wasn't perfect for you. You seemed you had a, an afternoon course, at least some of the days. So it yeah. seemed like you were kind of running into issues some days where you didn't have a lot of time. So it's really, it's just a matter of you don't really have the time to put in the work right now. Exactly. And, um, and I've also been playing PGA a little bit more recently because I've been working on a model for PGA using markup chains. Um, and there are some student projects that I've also been dealing with Um, For example, last quarter, so from January to March, I had three students, um, one who was coming up with an MBA and a WMBA model, the second coming up with an MMA model, and a third coming up with a League of Legends model. Wow. And so, so, you know, in in addition to teaching um, courses full time, I was trying to mentor these kids and like try to guide their projects. So it was just taking up all my time. And, you know, that is my real job. So DFS took a backseat. So I'm going to sound uh, maybe like a noob here, maybe maybe like a dummy, uh, but I'm going to ask it anyway. When people refer to their model, what exactly mm-hmm. does that, is that just projections? Is, is that all you mean when you say they're working on their model? Are they working on their projections or is it like projections plus, plus an optimizer? What exactly uh, do you mean when you, when you refer to your own model or your student's model? Oh yeah. So, you know, you know, we're both DFS. Well, you're a professional. I'm a semi-professional. But, you know, we both know there's two aspects to DFS, right? One is coming up with the projections or projective values, and the second is um, optimizing them correctly. And so, you know, personally, I think because uh, of my background, maybe I just think that optimizing, it's just not really something to work on, really, because if you have a, if your projections are pretty good, then you just, you know, take the top top projected whatever lineups from there without taking anything else into account, that should be a pretty good set of lineups. And of course, with some sports, there are things to worry about, like such as correlation between your lineups, right? Sure, of course. Um, But yeah, but I've been mostly working on trying to come up with the distribution of outcomes for each player. Okay. So so when you refer to your model, you're referring to doing simulations to figure out the distribution of outcomes? Exactly. Okay. All right. 
just had to figure out I had to ask that because I hear the term, you know, my model as I'm from different people. And I don't know if it means different things to different people, what, what their model is. Um, but, you know, as somebody who just uses publicly available information and, you know, just kind of does, uh, has a process that's a little bit more art than science, I don't, I don't have my own model. So I'm always curious what, what exactly people mean when they refer to their model. Um, that, that's a good explanation though. So for you, at least at simulations, um, I, I guess I don't know for sure that it's the same thing for everybody when they refer to their model. Um, okay. All right. So we, we touched on your present, your future with DFS at all. I'm glad to hear that you are not retiring. Uh, I feel like sometimes we, we've had conversations in the past where uh, you, you've you've kind of given me the impression that you might be thinking about it, like you maybe are not sure that you want to keep playing at high volume, uh, but I'm glad to hear that you're still in it for the long run because you're obviously a great player. And, and I think uh, it makes sense for you to play DFS given, given your interests and your skill level. Um, now let, let's get into your background a little bit. So on your website, genebkim.com, you say that DFS combines three of your favorite things, math, sports, and gambling. I'd love to talk about your background a little bit in each of those. Uh, let's start with sports. Tell me about your background. I know that you uh, have been an athlete, I think your whole life. So tell me about your background as an athlete and as a sports fan. Oh, so um, I've been a swimmer my whole life. And I you know, swam in high school. I swam club in college. And I swam masters in grad school and you know, went to several competitions until uh, like five years ago. And I also played uh, baseball, a little bit of football, not well though. And, I, and I'm still playing basketball recreationally. Um, you know, I made a team with my former students in January. We won ch uh, intramural champs. Jeans Beans, and right? Exactly, jeans, beans. What a great logo and team name. And you're and you're the short one. You're you're six one, and you're like the shortest <laughs> yeah, on the team. At six one, I was the shortest person on the team. That's rough. And uh, yeah, uh, my nickname was Midget, apparently. Oh no. Um, and uh, I recently started learning uh, how to play golf. You know, for for research. Okay. Yeah. Of course. Got to. All right, so so you've got, what, what about uh, your fandom? So you, you played a lot of sports. Uh, I know that you're a big Mets fan. Uh, where else does your, how, how long have you been into following sports? Uh, where does your fandom lie? Yeah, so I've been a huge baseball fan all my life. Um, you know, I spent some, some of my childhood in Korea and even then. So, you know, actually my favorite team used to be called OB Bears and now they're the Doosan Bears. So it's, uh, you, you were probably familiar with them. Because I, didn't, you... I didn't actually play. At least I didn't play much, uh, the Korean oh. baseball league. I, mo most DFS players got super into KBO uh, when we exactly. didn't have any other sports going on. That's yeah, funny yeah. though, yeah. I heard about it at least. Yeah. And then um, when I... When I came back to the, so I was born in the U.S., right? But then, so when I came back, eventually, I uh, grew up in New Jersey. And there are two baseball teams, there, right? The Yankees and the Mets. And, you know, no one really wants to root for the Yankees. So I became a Mets fan then. And I'm pretty glad for that because I think it's made me a uh, pretty mentally resilient uh, person. <laughs> you have to be, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, I've uh, also like the New York Giants, um, Eli Manning, the true GOAT. The true goat. Yeah. And I've been a, um, a hockey fan since pretty recently, maybe eight years ago. I had season tickets to the Anaheim Ducks. Uh, it's really how I got to, uh, got, got close to my wife now. Uh, oh, is she a hockey fan too? Yeah. yeah. So when I started dating or when we started dating, uh, we went to a bunch of Ducks games. That's awesome. Yeah. I, and uh... basketball. Um, my favorite player used to be Tim Duncan. And he retired, so now I don't really have a favorite team anymore. Sad. So, you, so you're a free agent. You know, we would welcome yeah. you to the Timberwolves bandwagon. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Playing tonight, game three. Come on, we're on the up, we're on the up and up. You know, uh, I, I do, I do love watching Pat Bev. Um, just he's a fun player. Gotta love Ant. Uh, I was gonna say you you mentioned that you're a big hockey fan. I just learned like two nights ago that the the uh, the Wild apparently have like a generational talent on their team. That is, he's been on the team for two years, and I never even I heard, heard of the guy. Love, right? Mate, that sounds that sounds right. He's, he's a Russian guy. Uh, yeah. I know that much. <laughs> Number <laughs> yeah. ninety-seven, I think. Yeah, I, I had never heard of him, but a couple of my friends are talking about him. Like, yeah, he's like, may, he could be Sidney Crosby, could be the next Sidney Crosby. I'm like, really? I've somehow never heard of this guy. And I live in Minnesota. I'm involved in sports all day, every day. Uh, never heard of this guy. So uh, I'm not the same level of hockey fan as you are. But that's uh, so. So you're a you're a kind of well-rounded sports fan. You're a fan of kind of all the different sports, uh, and and you your allegiances vary a little bit. Um, let me take a moment away from this conversation with Gene to remind you to give us a like and subscribe so you can keep up with all of our DFS shows, offers, giveaways, and much more. 
Once you subscribe, hit that notification button to get alerts when our shows go live. Be sure to also check out our monthly podcast giveaway. Just subscribe to our podcast channel and leave a five-star review with your Osmo username or Twitter handle to be entered to win a free month of Osmo Plus Platinum. All right. Let's talk about your gambling background. So, so I just looking through your Facebook posts, your Twitter posts. I see that you've got some fancy poker chips. Uh, are you are you a serious poker player? Uh, I used to be, and poker was my main source of income for for a, quite a number of years during the end of college and beginning of graduate school. Okay. So, so you have kind of a more similar background. Another way that you're you're different from me is that uh, you're similar to a lot of other DFS players in that poker was a big part of your life that you were, I guess, a professional. I mean, if it was your, your main source of income, you could call yourself a, a former poker pro. So it was kind of natural for you to move in uh, to the DFS space from poker. Uh, at first I didn't think so, but then I realized, you know, when you look, when you analyze your hand statistically based on hand history, you know, basically you're just analyzing previous data. And you know, I kind of more or less realized that when, when I was trying to build my own models that the process is pretty similar. Yeah. And of course that, uh, you know, no matter how well you build your models or how well you calculate things, you know, the luck is really the biggest component. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I guess, I guess hand to hand, uh, I would, I would agree that luck is the biggest component hand to hand. Would you agree? Would you say that luck is the biggest component long-term? Uh, long-term no, because, okay. um, you know, in probability, there's a law of large numbers, which says that, you know, with the larger your sample size gets your outcome is going to converts to your true mean. So if you're a positive EV player in the long run, you should be making money. All right. That's, that's what I, that's what I always tell people. A lot of people have trouble uh, understanding that. Uh, I mean, I think generally people who are watching this show understand uh, the law of large numbers. I, I think uh, a lot of more casual DFS players uh, do not, do not understand the, uh, the law of large numbers and just think it's, it's all luck essentially. So good to hear that from a professor. Uh, all right. Finally, uh, actually, before we move on, are you into any other kinds of gambling besides poker? I mean, sounds like <laughs> poker was a big part of your life for you. So when I used to go to Atlantic City and Vegas to play uh, in the casinos, like in the poker room, it was a ritual to risk 25% uh, of my profits at the blackjack tables because there's something about blackjack that I just can't get away from, even though I know it's a negative EV game. It's just so fun. It is a fun game. I, I actually, uh, I thought that I understood blackjack until I went to, uh, I played it at a casino. I think at, on the way up to my bachelor party, we stopped at a casino and stopped in a place in blackjack. And I was like, oh, there are like, there are other rules that I don't totally, like I understand the very basics of blackjack, but uh, yeah, I was, uh, luckily there was nobody other than my friends at the table. So they were just like telling me what to do, but uh, it's uh, a little bit more complicated than just the, the basic game that I knew as a child. Um, yeah, it's a fun game, but obviously I, I have trouble playing games that I know I can't win long term. I, I, I enjoyed playing some poker, uh, you know, same, same timeline, shortly after college, online for me, uh, but I couldn't get myself to do blackjack just because I know no matter how good you are, eventually you're going to be losing money. Um, all right. Now let's move on to the, the final three of your loves that are involved in DFS math. Uh, obviously, you your lecture at Stanford, pretty into math. Was that always the case? Did you love math as a kid? Um, love is a very strong word. Yes. <laughs> um, but so my dad actually also has a PhD in math, and he started teaching me math since I was three years old. So I was more or less kind of, you know, had math all around all the time. And actually, when I started out of college, I, got, I was kind of sick of math at that point. So when I, when I started at Rutgers, I was actually an electrical engineering major. And then okay. eventually to fill out my course schedule, I took some math courses and I was like, you know what? It's pretty interesting. So I just kept at it. All right. So, so did, did you end up getting like a minor in electrical engineering or anything like that? Uh, no, no, I have a degree in electrical engineering. Oh, well. you have a degree. Okay, sorry. Yeah. All right, so you have a degree in electrical engineering, and then you went on to become uh, a math expert and, and lecturer. So, so take me from there, from the electrical engineering degree. Uh, take me from there. Tell me about your background in math leading up to becoming a lecturer at Stanford. Okay. Um, yeah. So at Rutgers, I also did my um, uh, bachelor's in math, and so I finished my coursework in, in December two thousand seven. And okay. I had no idea what to do with my life at life back then. I thought about working at Wall Street. So I interviewed at a bunch of finance firms. I um, applied to some um, software engineering or like, you know, coding gigs. And then 
my advisor who was in the math department. He was actually a very nice guy. He tolerated me at my worst. And he strongly encouraged that I should apply to grad school. And, you know, I had no idea what grad school really was, even though I interacted with grad students at Rutgers. So I applied to a bunch of um, PhD programs. And eventually I got into a bunch of places and it came down to UCLA, you know, which is in sunny Los Angeles and MIT, which is in, you know, pretty gray Boston, right? I know the area. Yeah. <laughs> so I visited both and, you know, as soon as I got off the plane in LA, I was like, wow, there are no clouds in the sky. I, I'm not used to this. And I just felt happy there. So I ended up moving to LA in 2008. But, um, but during that time, um, for the six months, I was going to Atlantic City three, four days a week to play poker, and I was tutoring on the off, off days. What, what were you tutoring on? Uh, you know, AP classes, kids taking SATs, and I uh, tutor also tutor some um, uh, undergrads that are taking classes at Rutgers. Okay. All right. Yeah, and then so when I came to UCLA, and I started my program there, and I was taking a bunch of classes and studying for these things called written quals, which, you know, you have to pass to kind of continue gra uh, graduate studies. But I was also playing a lot of poker during the time. Like we had a poker crew. We were going to Vegas every other weekend. And there's these casinos in LA too, that we were just going to every, the weekends we we're not going to Vegas. This I is in 2018, as recently as 2018. No, 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 2008. Oh, 2008. Okay. Yeah. Remember, we're, we're old, Neil. We are old. So, so you moved to LA in 2008. 2008. Yeah. Okay. I misheard you. No, oh, my bad. Yeah. And then, um, so after three years or so, um, you know, grad school's rough. I ended up dropping out. And so I played poker for, for, as my sole source of income for a few months then. And I would also work on the weekends as a sushi chef. Wow. Yeah. Keeping busy. Yeah. And then, you know, I didn't want anything to do with math during that time, but then eventually I was like, you know, math is not so bad. So I reached out to some schools in the area and USC said, you can start here in January. So I went to USC for grad school and I finished my PhD there. All right. Well, uh, so, so are you, are you a pretty good chef in general uh i should warn any any ladies watching this gene is taking his taken he's a married man uh so i can't take advantage of this but uh are you are you a pretty good chef no I'm no okay no so my my main job at the sushi uh, restaurant was making the really easy rolls but driving up the liquor sales at the counter all right i'm, I'm a pretty good drinker right. way more than a chef all right maybe i will have to come out there hang out with you Let's uh, go. all right uh so we, we've talked about your, your three loves separately. Now let's combine them, talk about your DFS background a little bit. Uh, how, how did you learn about DFS? Um, so I started playing fantasy sports, like the season long ones around 2013 with some people that I was playing baseball with. And some of them told me, it's like, oh, you should really try this thing called FanDuel and DraftKings. You know, I've been, this was like in 2013, 2014 when they weren't advertising all over the place, right? And I was like, okay, well, so I looked into it, you know, I, looked, I read the re Wikipedia article and I was like, I have no idea what the hell this is. So I was like, all right, whatever. I'm not going to look at this further. And then, so I think it was 2014 or 2015, I was TAing an upper division statistics class at USC. And one of the students came up to me and he was like, oh, you know, you should really look into DraftKings. And he showed me a picture of, I think he turned $12 into $15,000. And he kept on rambling on and on about some Clay Thompson last minute three. You know, I wasn't really <laughs> listening too carefully, but the whole um, $12 to 15K aspect was pretty interesting to me. So um, I, I think I got him to refer me so that, you know, he and I both got credit. And then I started playing. Gene, and also, at the, sorry, and, sorry. And also at the same time, a student, another student that was in the class told me about this uh, guy named Matt Luxury or something. The, the guy that started RotoQL. Okay. All right. I, I was just going to make sure that when I tell you about my lineups, you're, you're listening. You're not saying this guy's rambling about some player. Just want to make sure that you're really listening to me. Of course, Neil. Okay. Uh, all right. So, so you learn about DFS and, and about when was this? When did you start playing? I think I started playing around 2015. All right. Started playing. Oh, around... wait. No, no. Sorry, sorry. I started playing in 2014. Okay. Yeah. 
I think that is in line with what I read on, on your website earlier, 2014, you started, which is right. I think I started in 2013, just really low volume, played a little bit. So we started around the same time. Uh, I was not successful right, right away. I was kind of just taking stabs at players that I didn't know anything about, didn't have projections or anything. Uh, were you successful right away? Uh, yeah. So I was actually fortunate enough because um, <clears throat> I think at that time, there weren't a lot of content sites around. And I, I believe RotoQL was like the best by far during that time. It's kind of what Osmo is now. Okay. Right. But then with all, with much fewer competitors. And they, they had projections for you. Did they have an optimizer? Yes. Yeah. So they had their um, they the guy made his own projections and they they had their own in house um, optimizer as well. Okay. So so you so you were. I, I apologize. I said earlier on that you were like me, that you started out slow and then you found Osimo and you really found success with Optimo, with Osimo. Uh, it turns out that was not the case. You actually did find success pretty early on using the uh, Roto QL stuff. I'm actually not familiar with the site, mm-hmm. uh, but but that's impressive. So you were playing, uh, were you playing primarily on one side or the other or, or were you playing both DraftKings and FanDuel right away? Mm-hmm. So I started both on FanDuel and DraftKings, and I lost the $100 I deposited in DraftKings like in two days. So I stopped playing on DraftKings for a while. And I was playing mostly on FanDuel. And, and honestly, RotoQL was so good that I didn't even know what was going on. I was just doing click, 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 you know, export C- CSV, and then I was just uploading without having any idea of what's going on. And I was like, oh, look, I'm winning. <laughs> so you can say I was uh, essentially luck boxing. <laughs> as, as most people do sure sure it's, it's all luck really uh oh yeah do, do you know if the site is still around is that is that now, a now defunct site that you used to use or did you just move on when you um, found awesome let me look i mean you, you don't have to answer i was just curious if there was a reason that you because you eventually did you found awesome and became oh, it's still, it's an still awesome around. subscriber okay yeah so how i actually became over or how i came over to awesome was Initially, I found Josh, uh, Josh Engelman's uh, streams yep. because, you know, like I was, so I was living in a town called Torrance near in Southern, like um, South of USC. And even though it's only what, like 10, 15 miles away due to LA traffic, it would take me an hour to go each way, right? During um, rush hour. And I was really just looking for some podcasts to listen to. So yeah, I came upon Josh Engelman's um, MBA things. Um, with, with sometimes with Adam, sometimes with, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Spax, that is. And then eventually, you know, NBA season ended we started to talk or they started talking about MLB and I was just, you know, listening to uh, Spax's uh, podcast for a while. And he had this thing, you know, if, if you guess, uh, if you guess a batter who hits the double, double dongs, then, you know, you get a, you get a week or a month of awesome plus for, uh, free. Nice. And I think I ended up guessing, so it was Mookie Betts, right? But then he was going up against a really good pitcher at the time. I think maybe it was Garrett. I'm not really sure. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so I was the only one that guessed him. So I got the free month. And when I checked it out, I was like, wow, I love this. I love, I like Fantasy Cruncher. And I really like, you know, when I looked through the site, there was just awesome. Awesome has so many things on there. Yeah, I imagine it kind of speaks your language. I mean, it's all based on probabilities. If you look at the the boom bust tool, the top pitchers tool, the top stacks tool, it's all really they give you the numbers that you need to be successful, and it's yeah. all math based. So I I imagine it's kind of speaking your language. Um, all right, so you became successful, or, or you you had been successful for a long time. You became mega successful, I would say, uh, in what 2019, 2020. You you won fifty thousand in MLB, and then you had several big wins, several five figure wins across uh, a lot of different sports. Actually, you, you were playing on Yahoo, you were playing on FanDuel, you were playing on DraftKings, you were playing baseball, you were playing basketball, you were playing football, uh, golf. It, it seemed like you were winning everything. Uh, was this uh, and, and you were already uh, then in at that point a lecturer? in the Stanford math department, uh, was it hard to convince uh, the, the university that the course probability and gambling was a good idea? Uh, not really, actually. I received a lot of encouragement when I just first floated the idea. So how so how the whole, um, the history came to be, if you're interested, yeah, is um, so the, after, so after I got my PhD from USC, I was a lecturer there for a year. And then after that, I applied to several research and teaching positions. So I was really, um, in the end, it came down to deciding between, um, I think it was Seattle and, and here. 
right? And you know, so there's a guy here named Percy Diaconis. Um, if you want, you sh- I mean, you should look him up on Wikipedia. He's, like, he's a fantastic guy, certified genius, and just a just very interesting person. But he was my advisor's advisor, and he's done lots of research that was very interesting. So I decided to come work here so that I can, I can talk with Percy. And also, um, DFS is illegal in Seattle. <laughs> important fact. And then, yeah, exactly. And then, so, so when the pandemic started, instead of meeting with Percy one-on-one, what we did was we started having these group meetings, you know, where it was Percy's PhD students and some of his postdocs and me, and then we just um, meet uh, every week for an hour, talk about our research. But, you know, the pandemic went on for a little bit longer than we expected. So after we started talking about our own research, we ran out of things to talk about. So we talk about other people's research that we found interesting. And, you know, that kind of runs out too. And then, so Percy, you know, knew, knew that I'm um, a profitable sports gambler. He's like, oh, why don't you just give us small talk on how you use probability, right? And so I gave a talk, um, you know, kind of just like a very short approach to what I do in NBA, MLB, and NFL. And Percy and one of his students asked a few very good questions. Like, like, how do you quantify this? Like, you know, for example, like, how do you quantify ownership leverage and incorporate that into your projections? And I was like, I don't. Um, I just click the like and dislike button on, on Fantasy Cruncher. <laughs> and, and so I started really thinking about it. And then I was like, you know what? I should just build my own model that just does everything. Yeah. So that's when I built my first rough MLB model and it just took off, right? Um, yeah. And because I was focusing on leverage at that time, yeah, so um, all my big wins in MLB in 2021 were with stacks uh, whose ownership was like 4% or lower. And somehow I was, I was able to quantify that pretty effectively. Okay. So uh, I, I was going to hold off on talking about your process until after we talk about the course for a while, oh, but I want to, okay. ju- no, no, I, I want to jump in now because this is really interesting. Uh, so, so you say that uh, in your model, you are incorporating ownership mm-hmm. somehow. So, so it is involved in when you run the Sims, uh, you are incorporating ownership into this, or, or are you, um, how, how are you incorporating ownership into your model uh, to the extent that you're willing to talk about it? Um, yeah, I don't want to give away as okay. much as Daniel does, but no, it's essentially, yeah. So I'm basically just boosting the medium projection ba- okay. um, based on like how low owned a stack is. Okay. And depending on the ownership, I may even increase the variance, right? Because essentially that's what it is, right? Because if you want low owned stacks to go off, you, you know, maybe, okay, may- maybe you don't really want to touch the median, so to speak, but you want to increase the variance so that you get, you, you hit the, you hit them not as much, but then when they do hit, you, you know, it is reflected in your projections. Right. So, so more similar to like, uh, what a hubro does, which is he does, uh, he does different randomness for each individual player to kind of capture their range of outcomes more similar yeah. to that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, interesting. Uh, Peter is also a really good DFS player and a really nice guy. Yeah, he is. I'm, I'm a big fan of Peter as well. Um, that's interesting though. So, so you, uh, so you do, so when you're doing your MLB, uh, when you're using your MLB model, were you not using Fantasy Cruncher at that time or were you incorporating it using the numbers that you got from your simulations and putting it into Fantasy Cruncher? Yeah, so at first um, I was, yeah, I was just bumping the projections and or adjusting the variance and and, and uploading that the Fantasy Cruncher is using that. But then, you know, their site would just crash from time to time. And also it wasn't do it, it wasn't doing the exact thing that I wanted to do because for example, um, you know, let's say like the, like the Cubs are really low owned that day. There's a diff, <clears throat> sorry, there's a difference between playing five Cubs batters than playing a single Cubs batter, right? Because even though both are really low owned or sorry, I mean, even though the Cubs are really low owned uh, when you have five of them versus one or two, it's, it's going to, it should figure differently in your lineup. Yep. Yeah. So, so I was basically had to make my own optimizer in order to deal with that. Okay. Interesting. And, and do, do you use your own optimizer for other sports as well, for NBA, for PGA? Um, 
I do have one for NFL, but then there's some bugs, and I'm just been too lazy to go back and figure out what's going on there. Okay. So you've yeah, been but, pr- primarily yeah, using Fantasy Cruncher for for other sports. Yeah, yeah. Because and because I think MLB is a sport where like the own the leverage is very important because you know it's one of those sports where it, randomness is huge, so it's almost impossible to get the projections right. So yep. I so I think I think baseball is really just an ownership game rather than like a projection game. Yep, I think that that's generally what I think of baseball being as well. It's just you're leveraging what the field is doing, trying to figure out what the yeah. field is doing wrong and, you know, playing playing against it. Um, yeah, that's that's generally how I play baseball too. Uh, do you think you're going to be getting back into the baseball streets this year? Yeah, so I have um, two students who want to work with me during the summer on building a baseball model. So nice. You know, It'll probably start June, and then I'll probably start max centering around August. Okay. I, pro- I promised them a, f- a, perc- a few percentage points of my profit, so they're really happy. <laughs> they're not going to just go off. I guess they're college students. They probably don't have enough money to go out and enter a ton of their own lineup. So I'm sure they'll they'll take the percentage points from you. That makes sense. Yeah. And are you are you doing your own projections then? So you say that you you know change the projections based on ownership. Are you taking those projections from somewhere, or are you just doing your own projections? Um, I do my own projections, and then I okay. usually compare them against Osmo's projections to, you know, to kind of just test whether or not it's reasonable. Okay. And do do you also do your own ownership projections? No, no. Okay. Do so you do for, use yeah, for ownership? Yeah, for ownership, okay. I, I I I stick with Osmo because it's been pretty good. Okay. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it generally works out well for me too using using the Osmo ownership. I definitely do not try to do my own ownership. Uh, as long as long as we're talking about your process a little bit, I've got a couple listener cues that uh, I think make sense to work in here. Uh, somebody actually DM'd me with a question for you. He asked, "Do you implement any machine learning into your process?" Um, I know you don't want to yeah, give away too yeah, much. Yeah, no, I do, I do, because you know, so sticking with baseball, for example. Um, sorry, that, that came up. I came out wrong. Yeah, but sticking with baseball, um, you know, it's there's a lot of people that go and look. He's like, let's look up Michael Conforto versus Max Scherzer. Well, first of all, it doesn't make sense right now because they're well, actually, no, Conforto isn't, isn't even in the MLB right now. But anyway, you know, you're looking at the uh, batter versus pitcher stats, but then it's a really small sample size, right? Like on on a good BVP, you have maybe what like 20, 30 at bats, right? And people are trying to draw conclusions based on that. So, but then, but past history does matter, right? Because certain hitters, uh, they react better to certain uh, types of pitches with whatever spin rate. And there are pitchers that throw like a whatever, um, you know, they have their own arsenal of weapons. So, but what you can do is you can profile um, each, or you can try to group similar pitchers and similar batters together. Mm-hmm. And that's where machine learning comes in. When you train a model to kind of just to, to, you know, to cluster the pitchers and the hitters together. And then when you look at a particular, you know, particular um, hitter versus a, a pitcher, then you look at this, the cluster that the pitcher belongs to and the cluster that the hitter belongs to, then the sample size goes from, you know, 10 at bats to up to like a thousand at bats. Yeah. And so, and so there you can make a, you know, kind of get a sense of better projections or a okay. better sense of, the, of how the hitter is going to do. I like that. So, so you group in players that are similar to get a larger sample size, and obviously it's uh, not perfect because the, there's still yeah, minor right. differences between some of those players. Yeah. Uh, ideally, maybe you would weight it more towards the more similar the player is, but I don't, exactly. I don't know if you yeah. get into all yeah, that. Yeah, no, no. Like, so even within the cluster, you can think about the distance between the like the you know, distance between the batters and the distance between the pitchers, and then you can use that to, to you know, that's you know, that's a pretty good idea, Neil. You know, come with oh, a weighted okay. average of based on the distance. Sure. Uh, it's an idea that I have, having no idea how to implement any of it. So uh, get, go ahead and, and take it. Uh, I feel like you can do the same thing kind of with, with NBA defenses. Like how how does this team guard? I, I'm trying to think of what the, the different play types are, but like there are, how does this team guard a, a tall ball handler kind of thing? Like, like how, you know, you can do the, the same kinds of things where you cluster in types of players, even if, you know, you can't look at individual matchups as well. You can look at, you know, different types of players. So, so I think that uh, a lot of play, a lot of sites try to do a similar thing with basketball to try to, uh, you know, incorporate, to, to make bigger sample sizes by finding similarities in players. Um, yeah, so one idea, so I haven't tinkered with basketball projections that much because I think 
um, because with basketball, and I think basketball is like the easiest sport to project bec because the number of attempts, so to speak, for, for each player is like the largest among all these sports. So, you know, it's where the central limit theorem comes in. And then, you know, most of the players, at least the starters that play 30 minutes, it's going to be normally distributed. Right. And mo most of the sites like um, Osmo, um, Sabersim, um, RG out there, they all do a pretty decent job of guessing where the median is going to be. Um, so one of the things I've been kind of thinking about, like now that you brought up how a team plays defense versus certain types of players is coming up with like a heat map, so to speak, for each offensive player and each defensive player and see how when like depending on which five players are on the court, like how the heat maps overlay. And yeah. so I've, I've been thinking about that, but then I don't really know how to quantify that really well. And then so, uh, but then also on that note, so did, you know, there are some people out there like Jesse, who's one of my favorite people on Twitter. He keeps on saying how you need to watch the games, right? Do you like, do you even watch the games, bro? And, you know, most of the times he's trolling, but, you know, when you talk to him, talk to him one on, like a one-on-one, -on -one, he's actually a really nice guy and provides very valuable insight. Like, and when you talk to him about basketball, which I think is his strongest sport, maybe, he knows exactly how every coach Play, deploys different types of defenses versus um, whatever team that they're facing, mm -hmm. and I don't like I don't want to speak for him, but I I'm pretty sure he makes adjustments based on the matchups. So that's why you know you see him winning 100k like every other week in NBA, and when you look at his lineups, he has like a one percent owned a player, and like 0.5 of that is due to him. Yeah. Yes, he, he, he's a very contrarian player too. He's uh, he definitely is willing to get different than the field and and gets upset when it doesn't work out very publicly. Uh, so, <laughs> so I also very much enjoy Jesse, uh, especially on, on on Twitter. He's a very uh, it's it's an enjoyable following the tilt. Uh, but I think that you're right that he he does uh, he watches the games a little bit and gets an idea of how the defenses react in, in different situations. So uh, yeah, he definitely has an edge. He's a great basketball. Player. I know he's also a great MLB DFS player uh, in, in general. I think he's. He's, he's a very strong DFS player in general. Oh, yeah. So I'm actually going to call my shot here. I'm going to win a major tournament or in MLB sometime in August, and I'm going to do it with a 3-2-2-1 stack Ooh. because because Jesse was going on a um, on a tilt rant calling someone a fish for playing 3-2-2-1. <laughs> so I'm going to do that. I already have my logo that says Jesse Sim, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win first place. I love it. That That is a great... Why, why are you waiting until August? Why not just do it sooner? I, um, you know, I, I'm waiting for my students to, uh, to, to work with. <laughs> okay, I get it. But I mean, if your students are doing a good job, are they going to come up with good three, two, two, one stacks? Or uh, it's going to make life more difficult if you're trying to make, if you're trying to win with a three, two, two, one stack, unless you know something that I don't know. And maybe, maybe there's edge in playing a three, two, two, one stack. Is that what you're saying? Maybe. <laughs> I, I figured you weren't going to give anything away there. No, but um, no. So when, one of the things that I like to do with, you know, I mean, because uh, when we talked about MLB, maybe last year, I, you know, we talked about how almost everyone plays like five man stacks. Yeah. But I think last year I was pl playing almost exclusively four two one one. Interesting. And, and then I think uh, maybe it was maybe it was Ryan, but I, I'm definitely I definitely discussed the merits of a four two one one stack with some people. And so I think you know, <clears throat> and because I think it's easier to talk about correlation between batting order and there's more when you just think about three players rather than five huh? because sure. for for a five player stack to be effective the whole the whole liner really needs to go off right right true and with a, but then with a three player because essentially you're, you're picking the three player to be your main core right and then so it's easier to kind of build around that for each team or at least that's the idea that i'm tinkering with okay. and we'll, we'll see how well it works yeah yeah, that makes sense. I mean, there, there is, there's obviously there's positive correlation throughout a baseball lineup just because uh, even batters who are, you know, five batters apart, you can, uh, you get more at bats, the better the, the other players in the lineup do. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept that you're tinkering with there. Um, obviously, I, I generally play five man stacks or four man stacks on FanDuel. I do, last year I played more uh, four, three, one stacks, but uh, I have not gotten into any three man being my being my primary stack. That's uh it's an interesting no, my, concept. My, my my main goal here is to tilt Jesse and be called yeah. a fish. Oh okay, okay. You're you're not being serious about this this three two two one. Stack. Oh no 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 I'm gonna set aside hundred lineups per day on three two two one. 
All right. Just so that you can win until Jesse. Okay. Yeah, I get exactly. it. Exactly. All right. Let me take a moment away from this conversation with Gene to tell you about our sponsor, No House Advantage. No House Advantage is bringing you a different way to enjoy DFS with player props contests. It's 100% peer to peer to help level the playing field with over 500 player props offered. All new users get a $25 deposit bonus with promo code AWESOMO. That's A W E S E M O. No House Advantage has mass entry capability with big prize pools. Beat your friends, not the house. Use our No House Advantage projections and optimal lineup tool to help you take down big prizes. Download in the App Store or play on nohouseadvantage.com. I've, I've got one more uh, listener question about your process that I wanted to ask. Uh, big Bear DFS asks, are there any resources that you use, uh, such as books, lectures, or short courses that are available to the public? Hmm. Well, so that's the thing about math, right? If there, there isn't going to be a book out there that says, all right, you know, this, the, the Mets are playing the Giants today. Um, you know, it's expected to, the expected score according to Vegas is like four to three, you know, build, build a projection thing for each player. Or there, there isn't going to be a math book out there that's going to tell you how to do this like process. But then, you know, the, but then when you pick up like a, decent probability books. Like, so if, if, if the Big Bear DFS wants specific ones, um, the standard probability books are, so I think, so this is the book that almost everyone uses. Um, okay. Called for a first, a first course in probability by Sheldon Ross. And there's also a book called, I don't know, something probability by uh, Blitz, Blitzstein and Huang which is the probability book that we use here at Stanford. Okay. So those yeah, are a couple of books you'd recommend. Yeah. So you know, basically like those books teach you the basic concepts of probability, and then you just need to apply that to DFS. Okay. And as far as I can tell, I've seen people ask whether you post or whether any of your lectures are recorded. And as far as I've seen, nothing that you do has been uh, available online. None of your lectures from your course have been published online for people. No, none of them are recorded actually. So, so the math, none of the math courses at uh, uh, Stanford are recorded. You know. Is that is that by rule? You're not allowed to yeah, record yeah, classes. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a department policy. Oh, that's a bummer. I was going to say we, we need to start petitioning, put in requests to have you record all your courses because I think there are a lot of people who would have interest in in following along and if, if you did record your courses and, and put them online. Um, all right, so we've talked a little bit about your process. Let, let's move back to talking about the course a little bit because I'm, I'm fascinated by this course. I think a lot of people will be too. Uh, we don't have a lot of people who are teaching this kind of stuff at the college level, especially at the level of uh, Stanford University. So uh, that's that's pretty impressive. Um, I read uh, an article in the Stanford Daily that uh, suggested that there was immediate enthusiasm for your course from the students and that uh, you were able to convince the university to increase the enrollment cap from 16 to 18 after more than 60 students signed up for the course. Uh, sounded like the students loved it based on the article. Uh, can, can you tell me a little bit about the course? Oh, of course. Also, oh, okay, sorry. So I forgot to uh, finish my story earlier. So anyway, so when I, when I, when I, when I uh, talked about how I use probability to gamble, and then, you know, they made some suggestions or questions, they asked some questions that led to suggestions. And then, um, you know, it really just took off in 2021. I got an email around early March of 2021. And they're saying, so these things are called IntroSEMs, which is short for introductory seminars. And their goal is to get the freshmen and or sophomores interested in like a field. Yeah. And so it's like a very small, um, class, like, you know, you know, capped at 16 people where, you know, you're trying, you're trying to get people to major in math, right? For example, if, if it's a math intercept. So I floated this idea of, you know, you know, I, I have a PhD in probability and, you know, gambling, everyone loves gambling. You know, can I, can I teach a seminar on this? And the department chair, he was very, very supportive. And because he, he also knew like how successful I was with DFS. And so he said, okay, you know, of course, it sounds great. Write up a proposal and I'll look it over for you. And during, um, look like Googling in order to, you know, make this proposal, like make, make this abstract for, for the seminar, I found out that uh, prob the field of probability theory was actually motivated by gambling. Huh. 
Yeah, so, so the story is, I think it's in the 1700s or the 1600s, two French mathematicians named Pascal and someone, maybe it was Lagrange yeah, no, or something. Yeah, yeah. They, they're, they're talking about playing a game of dice. And like, they're like, so it's like if, you know, it's based on like, do you get like at least one double six when you roll a dice 24 times or zero? Which side should I bet on? And then, so they started um, talking about it and then the field of probability was born. So, um, so anyway, so I wrote this proposal and it was accepted. And so the course itself was, you know, in the beginning, I, I assumed no knowledge of probability whatsoever. So for example, okay. first week, you know, I, I show up and then I talk, tell them what the like, probability of an event is. And then I introduced the easiest uh, casino game, which is roulette, right? Because I think that is that is a good introduction into into probability. Mm -hmm. And then every every week we talked about a casino game, which was more uh, complex probability wise. So I think we talked about craps, and then baccarat, and then blackjack. Right. And then, um, so it was like a two hour meeting. And then what we do is that for the last um, half hour or so, we actually simulate the games with, with the, with the roulette wheel and then the dice and the, like the blackjack shoe. Then because then, um, because, you know, essentially this is simulation, right? And it, it really helps students stay engaged, but also really think about the calculations and the concepts involved. And so once they got a pretty good sense of how to do um, complex slash annoying probability computations, we shipped it to modeling, which is, and then so we started to like DFS. We got two guys, two great guest lecturers to come in, um, your own, Bryn Pack, and um, Alan Lem from Roto Grinders, who lives in the area. Yep. And yes, yeah, so, and then so we ended up with a final project where they're put into groups of three. They had to pick a particular game that was happening on, on, a, on a day, and then they had to simulate results for that. When you say that you did simulations of the games, uh, so th this was in class, were you doing simulations like on a computer or do you just mean like you're having the students play the games or what, what do you mean exactly by having them simulate out how the games would play out? Oh, so the casino games. Yeah. Oh, so, so I, I actually have chips here. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So it's a course. school sanctioned purchase because it's a classroom <laughs> equipment. Of course. And yeah, so uh, we, 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 we basically took turns uh, because it was 18 students total. So we were, there were group, three groups of six, right? Because, you, you know, Blackjack, there were six players at a table and so on. So, you know, we would spend 10 minutes per group actually playing out. And I even made trophies for the people that did the best over the whole course of the quarter. And also awesome. the Black, Blackjack tournament. That's great. Uh, it sounds like a fun course. It's not not a shock that people love it. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about these guest lectures. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, so you had uh, Alan Lem first from mm -hmm. Roto Grinders. Uh, did did he go for like was it like a full hour long lecture? And and how much did he tell? Did he did he give away some secret sauce or no? Uh, so Alan uh, came and talked for an hour, and so it was actually the first first week that we started talking about DFS, and so he gave a very good. Um, introduction to DFS, where mm -hmm. it's not about winning every day. It is about that one day when you get everything right or the variance is on the right side and you're first place out of 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. And he also talked about the uh, risk involved and risk management. And he gave a really good sense of what DFS is. It's not just awesome. going out and just gambling. It's, it's optimization, but also there's luck involved, so you, you really have to look inward and consider how much risk you're willing to tolerate. That's awesome. I'm, I'm sure it drew some people in hearing, hearing from him, just hearing the general concepts and, and how even if you lose right away, you can still, like, if you play it right, you're going to win long term. It's not about day to day. I'm sure that kind of drew some students in. And then, exactly. like, like a month later, you had Rinpak on as well. Uh, was it a similar thing or did, did Rinpak, was he also there for a full hour? What kind of, what kind of stuff did Rinpak touch on? Uh, so Ryan was really nice in that he covered the whole two hours. So I, I wow. actually sat down for the whole two hours and he talked about a lot of things. So, um, the, and the thing, and so I think it was the first time, um, that he actually touted his, his screenshots. I saw some I of them in, in your picture. You took a, and there were several of them and I'm, yeah. it's not even, it's probably not even half of Rinpak's, you know, six figure no. screenshots. 
No, it was great because uh, he he showed off uh, his first uh, major win in each sport. Um, That's great. But also, then he was like, and then he presented that as like the fame and glory. But then he also talked about the other side of the coin, where you know inevitably you're going to have downswings. And he was very open about that. And a lot of students were actually very surprised at this. Yeah. That even that even professionals they 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 have they fall in tough times. And then so so Ryan talked about how um, you know to have if if you think you're a positive EV player, you need to have faith in your process and not not change something that's not broken. And or maybe you know how to analyze your lineups, as in like, is there something I'm doing wrong? Is this why I'm on a bounce swing? And so on. Yeah, that's and, yeah. yeah. Important and, and to that, talk about. Yeah, and then um, so Ryan did something awesome, which was um Actually, maybe he'll get trouble for this, but he gave the students each a uh, free month of Osmo. I saw that. Yeah. And so promo code he, Gene, huh? Yeah. Promo code Gene. Let's go. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so he, and then we did like a class on hands um, uh, project where um, each person had to build a bunch of lineups. And then I think, I think Ryan actually entered them into the contest. Oh, really? Yeah. And that's who were there? 18 students. I don't know how he did, but yeah. 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 So they each got to enter. Okay, wow, that's uh, I'm sure I'm, I I would guess that if he won, he would tell you, or maybe he wouldn't. Maybe he's just like, all right, this is my money now. Not gonna okay. not gonna give it back to these kids. I don't know. <laughs> um, that, that sounds really fun, and yeah, it's uh, it's great that Rimpack kind of goes in went into, you know, the losing streaks, the the downside of DFS because everybody goes through. That was something that uh, that stun on Matt Matt Naughton talked about mm. last week on the show was that I need to. He says that I should have more people on who are former DFS pros uh, who, you know, could be, you know, it's important to talk about analyzing whether do I still have an edge? Is it, you know, do I have enough of an edge that it's worth all of the uh, anxiety related to DFS? So uh, it's definitely good to show people, I think, kind of that that dark side from time to time, that the, the harder times with DFS, because, you know, on this show in particular, I'm, I generally have on people who are very successful at DFS currently. So uh, that's that's awesome that Rinpak was willing to talk about, you know, even, even among someone who of someone who is uh successful currently going through some some tough times so that's awesome um all right so so you mentioned you brought this up a little bit earlier so uh i read in the article about you at the stanford daily through intro stems plus a program meant to create research and mentorship opportunities for students who have completed an intro sem you gave three students the opportunity to continue their work um, so you're taking some very bright minds. These are Stanford students, and you're giving them a teacher who's had a lot of success at DFS. You're exposing them to some of the other top players in the world. Uh, are you aware of any of your students continuing to play DFS seriously? Um, so the guy that built um, the model for League of Legends, so his mom actually gave him a DraftKings gift card. <laughs> That's great. So, so we'll see how that goes. All right, so so is that not? I I don't play League of Legends DFS either. Another one of those that I never really got into uh, during the pandemic. Is that happening right now? Um, I think so because okay. because in that Discord by Jesse, there are these two guys. I think uh, Will Patterson who works at Saberstone. Yeah. And Nathan. Nathan, Nathan Van Hare. Yeah, Van Hare. Yeah, um, and maybe even Ian. So Ian, Ian the human being. Like they're always yeah, talking yeah. about um, CS:GO lineups. So I assume League of Legends is still happening. Okay, nice. So so we'll, we'll get to find out soon enough. And then another one of your students uh, from the Intro Sems Plus said that she wants to apply what she's learned to create her own projection site for women's basketball by running a large-scale simulation on the sport. Uh, the WNBA season is coming up in May. Do you know if she is ready to, to run those projections? Uh, she does have a model in place, but I think she's uh, given up on the idea of trying to sell this to the public once she okay. realizes how much work is involved for marketing and whatnot. Okay. We're just going to make money by ourselves. So you guys are just going to use her projections? Yeah. All right. That works too. Um, yeah. So it, I'm afraid that you're creating a monster here. I mean, I feel like we, we all should be afraid that you're you're finding these Stanford students, you're teaching them how to play DFS. Uh, how, how long do we have before these Stanford students take over the world and we lose our edge? Uh, don't worry about that. I'm sure they'll go on to non DFS things to find their greatness. So uh, all right, I, all I, right. I think, I think we're all safe for, for the time being. At least for now, they're college students. They probably don't have a ton of money in their pockets to be playing at DFS. Um, 
All right. So, so uh, on a more serious note, but uh, just touching on that subject, since it's ca- since it came out, I've been asking DFS players in general uh, about what their time horizon is for how long they think it's feasible to be a DFS pro. Um, you actually sound like you are more optimistic than some in that, uh, or, or at least you, you mentioned that you think that long term you can win at DFS, uh, even though there's a lot of luck involved, um, you know, day to day. Are you concerned at all about DFS becoming a game where kind of people won't have an edge because the field gets too good or, you know, the sites raise the rake uh, and it's just not going to be worth playing professionally. Do you, do you have any concerns about that? Oh, I mean, I think eventually all, all DFS players are going to be become pretty much the same person where they're just going to have really good models and everyone's going to be, you know, have, have very good outcomes. So it's, I think it's just going to even out in the end. Okay. Like, you know, if I can draw like an analogy to poker, back in 2006, if you just read these two books by Dan Harrington and you into Vegas, you were just guaranteed profit, right? But then now, like in you know, starting with 2010, 2011, there are a lot of these po- poker uh, poker blogs on YouTube, and so when when I been going to Vegas recently, you know, up to like 2018 or so, I noticed that even among tourists, the level of play, while still poor, was getting significantly better than, you know, 10 years ago. And I assume this is happening with DFS too. Yeah. Um, You know, and and I think another thing that's happening is that when I watch my recreational friends, they lose their money in DFS and they're just done playing. Yeah, so... right. So the so the player pool, so to speak, for DFS is getting smaller and smaller. I think. Okay, that's unfortunate. And then I mean, if if everybody becomes the same player, if everybody comes too good, then we're just going to lose out to the rake, and it's going to be impossible to beat the game really at some point. Yeah. No, I mean, and, and the and the thing I like about DFS is sure, like the profits are nice, but I really enjoy the process of coming up with models and. And you know, getting self uh, validation that when my models like are pretty spot on, yeah. and the whole um, idea of portfolio analysis, where you know, you know like your portfolios, if you have 150 lineups, you know, I think there's it's it's a really fun mathematical problem, and so that's really what I enjoy doing, and yeah. also um, using DFS as a teaching tool has been pretty good too. Yeah, it seems like a pretty, and, and the students uh, seem to enjoy it, just based on the one article I read, which obviously doesn't mean much. But then I also, I look at your your posts about it on Twitter uh, and uh, on Facebook. It seems like you always get students replying that you're you're one of their favorite teachers. So it, it seems like there's a lot of enthusiasm for your courses. Maybe it's not just the course. Maybe they just like the professor. But uh, it seems like there's a, there are fans out there of this, uh, this concept. Yeah, I so might be starting good. a cult here. I, that, that's what I'm worried about, and a very smart call. But I'm I'm going to take your word for it that they're not going to take over the DFS. They're going to go find their success elsewhere. Uh, I, I hope that's true. Um, all right, let, let, let's close it out. Uh, let me let me ask you about your favorite DFS win and celebration. I like to end on a high note. Uh, you've had a lot of great wins. Can you tell me about your favorite DFS win and celebration? Um. So so the 50k win from MLB. Last April was pretty big because it actually happened on my wife's birthday. But my actual favorite win was a much smaller win. And so it was on Yahoo on PGA. And so it was like a, I think it was a $15 entry. So I took both first and second place. Nice. <laughs> so so I, I love asserting dominance whenever I can. <laughs> so <laughs> I, and, um, Yes, I, I like that win, but also because the second place lineup didn't have the actual winner of the tournament in there. Oh wow! Yeah, so I so that is like an example. Like the, like when I first teach DFS to to the students, I say you don't have to get the actual like outright winner right, just like you would in normal sports betting, and that's what sets DFS apart. So it is creating a, a, a nice balance of players. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that, that's a rare thing. You, you usually are going to need the winner, but uh, I've definitely, you're, you're not the first time I've heard the story of a golf lineup. I think it actually happened recently as well. I think that might have been RBX88 when he won a Millie Maker in golf. He did not have the winning golfer, which mm. seems like it'd be a lot, pretty hard to do, but uh, that is uh, definitely an impressive feat to, to take second or first in a tournament without the winner, just given the amount of bonus points you get for winning. Yeah, and I also want to give a shout out to Jason, Jason Ruslan or Rouslin. I don't know yeah. how you pronounce his name, um, but because I was I was I was DMing Jason during that tournament, and I had no idea how the scoring actually worked. <laughs> and then so I think what happened was like John Rahm and this other guy went into the playoffs, 
And then I was like, hey, Jason, what the hell's going on here? And Jason's like, oh, I think you win either way. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, All right. oh, okay. That's sweet. Yeah. Pretty sure it's uh, Rosslyn because his his screen name is Rosini with Zs, like mm -hmm. R-O-Z-Z. -Z. So it's gotta yeah. be it's gotta be Rosslyn, right? I've heard him say it on streams. Uh, so I'm gonna go with it's Jason Rosslyn. Yeah, he's one of the the top DFS uh, minds, a uh, good awesome old guy. Um, all right, so so you are a professor or you are a lecturer. You teach this stuff. Uh, are you uh, open to like? Can people DM you? Can can people DM you with questions on Twitter? Where can people oh, find course. you? And, and are you willing to talk with people? Okay. Oh yes, of course, of course. Uh, yeah, just you can DM me on Twitter, Gene B. Kim, or you can send me an email, Gene B. Kim at Stanford.edu. It's fine. Giving out the email and everything. Wow. Yeah. You, you mean it. You're ready to talk I mean, about it. My email's on, on, the, on my website anyway, so. Oh, okay, that, that's fair. It's easy to find professors. That's actually, that's how I found Whistles Go Woo after I met him. I looked him up on uh, the Yukon website and found his email address there, and we've been in touch since then. So I guess that, that does make sense. You can find you pretty easily. So, uh, yeah. That's awesome that you are willing to talk to people. All right, so uh, at Gene B. Kim on Twitter. Anywhere else people can find you? Mm -hmm. I, I guess you um, gave your email address. That's yeah, I'm also on Facebook, Gene B. Kim. But <laughs> all right, and cool. I don't know what, I don't know where else I I can be on. So yeah, that's that's a good enough. I think you, you've given enough spots that people can find you. Uh, well, thanks a lot, Gene. It was it was great to have you on. I uh, really appreciate you coming on for episode ten. Thank you to Mike Lawrence for producing the show. You can find episode 11 of High Stakes next week, Friday night, uh, 8 Eastern time on the Osmo YouTube channel or wherever podcasts live. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend.